various portraits, these pictures of discipleship by looking at the original disciples. I invite you to hear the story of the call of Philip and Nathaniel. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, Jesus said to Nathanael, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, thank you for the call, the invitation that you place on every one of our lives. Regardless of our age, our circumstances, our stories, help us to know that that invitation is always there to come and see, to follow your son, Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts this day be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Lord, our rock, our friend, our redeemer. Amen. It is not my intention to offend any tea drinkers out there, but I simply would be unable to live without coffee. When I'm holding that first cup of coffee in the morning, even if just for a few moments, all is right in the world. Nothing else matters. It is said that highly caffeinated people do more good, and I believe that. (laughs) Coffee is the most, is the second most traded commodity in the entire world, second only to oil. In America alone, 83% of us adults drink coffee. That translates into 5 million tons of coffee a year in this 30 billion dollar a year national industry. A few years back, I came across a book by Leonard Sweet called The Gospel According to Starbucks. <laughs> Leonard Sweet, if you've ever heard his name, he's an author and, and theologian and professor and even a visiting professor up at George Fox in Portland. And whether you like Starbucks or not, Sweet examines that the Starbucks experience, not simply to talk about the four million coffee drinks that Starbucks alone sells daily in America. But he uncovers how Starbucks simply took an old, hot, dark liquid in a cup and made it into an experiential, participatory, image-rich, connecting beverage that millions of people feel they can't live without. Starbucks has come close to perfecting the notion that life is meant to be lived with passion. And that passion is found in and practiced through experiences, through connection, through symbols and images, and the full participation of every part of your being. Sweet says in this book that Christians have a lot to learn about faith being a lived experience not simply a thought experiment. 
In fact, he says rational faith, the form of Christianity that relies on argument and logic and apologetics to establish and defend its rightness, has failed miserably in meeting people where they live. Starbucks, he says, knows that people live for engagement, connection, symbols, and meaningful experiences because life at its very best is a passionate experience, not a doctoral dissertation. The problem, he continues, is not that Christianity can't be believed, but that it can't be practiced because of its lack of lived experience. And it can't be observed by others because there are too few Christians, he says, who are radical enough to manifest what the gospel really looks like. Those are challenging words. I'm not sure if it's always been this way or if I'm just paying more attention given the climate of today's world and that the church is very much in the midst of a reformation. But as I continue on my own journey of learning what it means to follow Jesus Christ, I see more and more how in the midst of the 40,000 plus traditions, versions of Christianity there are around the world, it really only boils down to two different versions. The one version of Christianity is the commandment keepers, the rule followers. This version often focuses more on the Bible itself than who the Bible points to or who the Bible reveals, which in turn can very much turn the Bible into an idol. This version of Christianity is a gatekeeper, always claiming who's in and who's out what you should do and what you shouldn't do, who is wrong and who is right, who, is on the, who should be on the outside of the wall of safety and righteousness that we've built for ourselves. This version finds comfort in the status quo because it's comfortable and safe. I've got mine, so literally to, the, to hell with the rest of you, this version says. This version spends more energy on Jesus dying for my sins than it does on Jesus living for my soul. This version speculates more on what heaven is going to be like than on working to create what earth should be like. The other version is made up of people across those 40,000 traditions and even beyond who are actively learning and trying and striving and growing into what it means to follow Jesus Christ the Jesus Christ who is revealed in the Gospels. Not a white, attractive, conservative American or European Jesus who blesses everything you touch and is only concerned about your individual salvation, but a dark-skinned, Middle Eastern Jesus who plunged himself over and over and over again into the messes of life in this dirty world and who is deeply concerned about the well-being and salvation of the entire cosmos. Red and yellow, black and white, gay, straight, transgender, Republican, Democrat, independent, immigrant, refugee, and white-collar CEO, those who are without much sin and especially those who are so full of sin you wonder if there's any crack for light to break through at all. This version didn't stand from a high place of privilege telling everyone what they were doing wrong. But this version instead sat with the nasty and broken people around a table where categories became real stories, where strangers became friends, where behaviors got changed, where barriers broke down and relationships with all the wrong people were grown. I don't know much. I really don't. But I do know that somehow over time, this Jesus has been hijacked. And I know that this hijacked Jesus is the Jesus that I personally continue to fall more in love with because this Jesus is worth following. This Jesus who advocated for the broken and the lost and who also challenged the righteous, and the powerful. This Jesus, who is the visible expression of the invisible God, 
a God who said, finally, enough is enough. Let me show you how to be human. I'll become human in the very chaotic, unforgiving filth in which you live so you can see what it means to be human and how it feels to be a human deeply loved by the God of the universe. That's the gospel, I believe. And the question is, are you and I radical enough to live what that really looks like? Philip and Nathaniel were. Who were Philip and Nathaniel? Nobodies. They didn't matter any more than the homeless guy on the street, or the Syrian refugee, or the migrant worker in Central Oregon, or the barista at Starbucks, or the annoying person blocking your way in the produce section at Winco during opening weekend. <laughs> Jesus found this man, Philip, and said to Philip, follow me. The next thing we know, Philip finds Nathaniel to tell him they found the Messiah who has been hunkering down in Nazareth of all places. And in one of the most telling and amusing lines in all of Scripture, Nathaniel says to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, he asks the universally familiar question, huh? Are you kidding me? You're telling me the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for, the one who Moses and all the prophets proclaimed, the one upon whom our very lives depend, came from that dump of a town, Nazareth? This Savior, this one who will set things right by conquering injustice and will remove that giant boot of oppression on our throats, that one, you say, has been in Nazareth this whole time? Give me a break, Philip. Give me a break. And Philip's response? Come and see. When the Wright brothers were working on their first airplane, the word of their experiment spread throughout Dayton, Ohio, where, they're, where they were from, their hometown. And a local skeptic summed up the sentiment when he declared, no man will ever fly. And if any man does fly, it won't be anybody from Dayton. If any man from Dayton flies, it won't be a Wright brother. The skeptic was wrong on all three accounts. A man did fly. He was from Dayton, and he was a Wright brother. It wasn't rational in any way that the Messiah came to them from the podunk village of Nazareth. This was not what they were expecting, not what they had in mind for their salvation. But then neither was the filthy animal and their tendency to make wherever they are a restroom infested stable where Jesus was born, or the garbage dump where he was crucified, or the hole in the earth where resurrection broke through. We don't even get out of chapter 1 in John's Gospel before Jesus is met with resistance. Nathaniel puts up his guard, saying, not so fast, hold on, you've got to do a lot better than that. He doesn't question the truth of God showing up and the possibility of that. He questions if the truth of God, let alone anything good, can come out of a God-forsaken hole in the earth like Nazareth. Can anything good come out of a homeless shelter? Can anything good come out of a prison? Can anything good come out of inner city Oakland? Can anything good come out of the adult shop along the freeway? Can anything good come out of the crack house down the street? Can anything good come out of Washington, D.C.? Can anything good come out of Israel and Palestine? I'd like to believe that Philip was aware that it would take something special to convince his friend and that nothing he could say at the time would really convince Nathaniel. And I'd like to believe that Philip knew his friend needed that lived experience of this Jesus 
And so he echoes the words, the very words of Jesus himself, come and see, hoping that once he did, Nathaniel would be hooked. Could it really be that something that good can come about in such an unlikely way? Still, Nathaniel, he accepted Philip's invitation to move forward, even though he had questions, he had doubts, he was highly skeptical. And as Nathaniel is going toward Jesus with his hesitations, Jesus actually calls out to Nathaniel first. Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Whoa, how did you get to know me? Nathaniel asked Jesus. I saw you. I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you, Jesus says. I saw you. The discovery that he had been seen, that he was already known, was enough to change him right then and there. Frederick Buechner says that faith is the direction, faith is the word that describes the direction our feet start moving when we find that we are loved. I think something close to this happened here with Nathaniel. All because of those words, come and see. Which in some way are at the very heart of the story of Scripture. With Moses, remember, who struggled with his murderous rage and the fact that he couldn't speak clearly. God says to him, come and see, Moses, how I will help make you the greatest leader in Israel's history. How I will help get you through this. With Abraham and Sarah, who thought it was absolutely ridiculous, so ridiculous that they laughed, that through their aged and battered and broken and, and worn down bodies, that God would do something special through them and bring them a son of promise and blessing. But God says to them, Come and see. Give me a chance to make it happen. Let it be as I say. With David, who mistreated his own passion on a number of occasions. God says, let me help you get a grip on your life so I can make you into one of the greatest Hebrew kings. Come and see how this will be, David. With Samuel, whose devotion and willingness to hear God, to listen to God at a very young age, plunged him into something great. And with the Lord's invitation to him, come and see, Samuel that I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. With Jeremiah, so what if he was also young in age? God tells him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart to speak for me. Come and see how I will make that happen. With Mary, No one would blame her for even having a glimmer of doubt or fear about what was going to happen in and to and through her, not to mention the social rejection that would mark her life. But again, God speaks into her life the greatest come and see. Maybe something good could come out of Nazareth after all. The invitation to come and see what God will do with our lives as disciples does not ever stop. I really can't do much more with my life or more as a pastor than to simply extend an invitation to come and see. Come and see this Jesus. And when I extend that invitation, I'm extending it first and foremost to myself. I have no interest in the status quo because the Jesus I follow does not, did not, will not have an interest in the status quo either. I want to follow Jesus into whatever mess he is going to restore. Can anything good come out of the most wretched place or situation or life? Yeah, it can. It did. It does, it will, because the Jesus I believe is worth following keeps 
going head on into those God-forsaken places. Only this time, friends, he doesn't go alone. He gives an invitation to each and every one of us to go as well with him, to participate, to come and see, he says, to come and see and live and experience and participate and connect with every part of your being what it means to love and be loved. Amen.